We are really fortunate tonight uh, to have Sadie Drury with us here. She is the uh, vineyard manager at Seven Hills Vineyard, and Seven Hills is where our Carmenere grapes are from. And so, Sadie, I can't believe that you're taking the time to join us here and uh, talk about the vineyard and uh, Carmenere, how we grow it. And uh, uh, so it's, um, like I say, we're just really, really uh, uh, fortunate to, to have her here with us. So um, Sadie grew up here in Walla Walla. In fact, uh, she was a neighbor of mine in, in our first house, or just, yeah, your parents lived, what, about a block away, not even a full block? Yeah. Not even a block. What's that? I said not even a block. It was just yeah, I think four or five houses and down. I'm trying to remember. Did you actually do a, a little swimming uh, teaching for our kids? Teach our kids I, some swimming? I did. And I think I might have even babysat once or twice, but I can't remember. <laughs> I babysat actually, for a lot I of neighbors. I think you did. I know. I know. We saw your uh, younger sister a lot too at the swimming class. Yeah. Too. So, uh, but uh, Sadie's worked over on Red Mountain, and uh, Sadie, I should actually probably let you jump in and give more of your biography. And because, uh, 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 gosh, how long have you been at Seven Hills now? This I'm starting my eighth vintage already. Gosh, which, man, it's, it's just kind of mind blowing because I feel like I started yesterday, and now I've already been here for almost eight years. Yeah. So I, I say starting my eighth vintage, we're halfway through the year already. <laughs> yeah, well, I feel like I just moved to Walla Walla, too, and it's uh, coming up on 28 years in August. So. Yeah. 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 So, uh, Sadie, I'm just, do you mind if I just turn it over to you and you can give us a little bit of your background? And Yeah, no problem. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me tonight. This is such a fun break from normal. Uh, I have a couple small kids at home and I'm excited to be not home with them right now. Uh, and I think as parents, you all know, sometimes you need to get away and during quarantine, you can't get away. So thanks again. Um, so I started in the Enology and Viticulture program in Walla Walla in 2007. And I, I knew I wanted to grow grapes and uh, Stan Clark was still alive at the community college at the time. And I went into his office and I said, hey, Stan, I'm going to grow grapes. And he kind of laughed at me a little bit. He's like, well, it's not, there's not a lot of grape growers. It's not easy. And I'm like, I'm going to do it. <laughs> he said, okay. And he let me in the Enology and Viticulture program. And uh, I, I went to that program. At some point, I transferred to WSU. Um, I started my first internship at Seattle du Cheval for, in 2008 on Red Mountain. So I worked on Red Mountain for five years. And then when my first daughter was born, I had been commuting from Walla Walla to Benton City, which is about uh, an hour and 15 minutes every day. So we decided at that point to try to stay in Walla Walla. And I applied for a job um, when my daughter was like two weeks old. And I, I started this job when she was eight weeks old. And I've been at Seven Hills ever since. That was in uh, 2013 and uh, I started as the assistant manager in 2013 and became the manager in 2014 and I absolutely love it. I love farming. Uh, I love growing grapes. It's definitely demanding but um, I think I work at the best vineyard around and with the best winemakers. Well I tell you it's really amazing especially during harvest because uh, gosh you get out there what about 3 three thirty in the morning something like that? Yeah we just start picking it <laughs> yeah and then uh, your two little girls and uh, it's it's fun seeing them out there at the end of the day and <laughs> the end of the day for Sadie is what I don't know about two three o'clock in the afternoon it is yeah so if you, if you come out yeah if you come out to the vineyard on a on the weekend uh, my kids are usually out there my husband's really good at wrangling them but um, we just have to find family time where we can get it and uh, on the weekdays, he'll bring him. He'll bring him out after school, and so Chuck is right. You'll see my kids running around in the vineyard with me. Yeah, uh, it's, it's cool. It's we we all make do during harvest. There's, there's a lot lot to do, and uh, the grapes don't sleep. And uh, it's just go 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 from uh, oh gosh, mid August to end of uh, October into the beginning of November. So. Um, 
But uh, anyway, today we are going to be talking about our uh, two common airs that we bottled here just uh, not too long ago. Um, <clears throat> the first one that we will talk about is our 2017 Reininger Carmen Air. And I saw many of you have that. And also, we're going to be talking about our 2014 CPR Carmen Air. So this one has been cellared for a while and uh, very, very special. Uh, I've never done a CPR Carmen Air before. Uh, but to uh, just give you a little background on the grape itself, um, it's an ancient Bordeaux grape and uh, the Romans actually uh, planted it. They thought it was one of the finest grapes um, that they knew of. And uh, it's uh, from Bordeaux area. In fact, um, back in ancient Roman times, I'm trying to remember the exact uh, pronunciation of it anyways, Beturica, I think, and uh, Pliny the Elder, he actually given some indications that it may have actually originally came come from Spain, the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, but it's uh, very, it's perhaps one of the most ancient Bordeaux varietals anyway. Um, and it's grown primarily in Madoc area. It was also grown in Groves. And, um, but um, the name Carmen Air, um, Carmen, uh, the Latin root for it means uh, uh, crimson. So go Cougs. I see a lot of you West Siders over there. So I know there's a lot of Husky fans too. Oh, by the way, just a little side note, we're actually doing, uh, making uh, the Cougar uh, wine this year. So the WSU Cougar wine, it's Cabernet Sauvignon that we'll be bottling in July. So if you see it out there, grab it. You know, it's made by, by Reininger. But, um, Anyway, it's um, also known as the Lost Bordeaux. It's perhaps uh, the most intriguing story of uh, any grape there is. Um, so Carmenere is one of the six noble red Bordeaux varietals. There's Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Cabernet Franc, which are the most known. But then there's also uh, Petit Verdot, Malbec, and the long lost Bordeaux Carmenere. And, uh, it's called the Lost Carmen Air because it actually, the story uh, really starts here in North America with the early European explorers visiting here and discovering that there's lots of indigenous grapes. They took some of those indigenous grapes back to Europe with them and along uh, living in, amongst the roots of those indigenous North American grapes was a little bug called phylloxera. When that bug got to Europe, spread like wildfire, and devastated the vines of Europe. And uh, so around between 1860 and 1880, they replanted it in Bordeaux. Um, I should say they replanted Bordeaux. They discovered that there's actually a uh, Texas horticulturist who figured out that you could uh, graft the European grapevine to the North American vines. So, and that's, uh, I should back up a little bit real quickly. The, all the European vines are known as vinifera grapes and they'd never seen phylloxera, so they had no resistance to it. And that's why they were devastated. It's kind of like smallpox coming to North America. Um, so, but the North American plants evolved with phylloxera and uh, had developed um, resistance to it. So um, this Texas horticulturist figured out that you could graft the European vine to the North American rootstock. And that's what saved Bordeaux and saved all of Europe, actually. So now all of Europe is grown on European uh, rootstock. And uh, we'll be seeing a lot more of that here, too, unfortunately. But um, anyway, uh, um, the, the grape, they chose not to replant Carmen Air. Uh, when they, and the reason for that is it's a very focal grape, especially if you get in cooler climates, it likes a lot of heat, but uh, Carmen Air is susceptible to calure. So right about this time of year, actually, uh, if you have a lot of wind, moisture, uh, rain episodes going on and the plant is trying to uh, flower and uh, those turn those flowers into berries, a lot of those uh, berries or flowers now become berries something called shatter. And it's also susceptible to powdery mildew, but because of that, 
Carmen Air in Bordeaux has very, very low yields, but it was actually treasured quite a bit um, as, a, as a grape varietal. But uh, anyway, they chose not to replant it, and we thought that it was almost extinct in Bordeaux. We thought we're down to about maybe 30 or 40 acres left in the world. Well, we're going to fast forward a couple, another century or so, and um, to, uh, well, actually, I'm going to go back to the replanting of the Bordeaux, because luckily, right before uh, phylloxera hit, um, a lot of Merlot, anyway, was uh, Bordeaux varietals, were exported from Bordeaux to Chile. And um, so then we fast forward to 1994, and we thought most of uh, Carmenere was extinct in the world. Um, and uh, there was a French um, empelographer, this is somebody who studies grapes, he's um, uh, from Montpellier is where he uh, did his research anyway in southern France. And uh, he was in Chile and tasting through checking out these Merlot clones and there's one that's called uh, Merlot Numel. And uh, there's Numel Valley in Chile outside of Santiago. And so they thought he was tasting this one particular clone and he thought, I don't believe this is actually uh, Carmen Air. Yeah, I mean, actually Merlot. So did some DNA testing and they found out that it was actually Carmen Air. So it's kind of like finding the Titanic, man. It's this wonderful treasure. So that's how Carmen Air was rediscovered. And um, it comes to us um, via a vineyard called uh, Guanac Vineyard, uh, Guanac and Langtree Estates uh, down in California in the 1980s. Um, uh, what was it Kathy uh, Moland? I think is her was her name. Anyway, she uh, was one of the uh, co-owners anyway of Guanac, and she had been working uh, with somebody over in in uh, France anyway about Carmen Air and and brought brought some cuttings over. So, uh, Sadie, you might know a little about this. Um, so that was in the eighties when she was working. Uh, with Carmen Air. And I know that um, Leonetti got their cuttings. Uh, didn't they get their cuttings from Guanac? They did. If you had asked me this question last summer, I couldn't have answered it. But uh, I went on a mission this winter to figure out where every vine came from. And those cuttings were propagated, I think, in 1997 and planted in 1998 or 1999. Uh, and they came from Quinoc. Right, I know they were uh, planted in 99 at Seven Hills anyway, and we started mm -hmm. working with it in 2002. But um, so I really have questions. I haven't been able to verify, okay, are those cuttings uh, then, uh, did they actually come originate in Bordeaux or were they Chilean? and came up and went through quarantine and that's a good question uh i don't think it says the answer on the paperwork i got um i do know that they went through a quarantine process and i do know that they were very hard to get and i have a paper trail of gary figgins from leonetti contacting a lot of people before he got in contact with the right person who to get him cuttings and it he didn't get them directly from the vineyard. I think he had to find a nursery who was willing to work, or that that, vin that vineyard was willing to work with to get the cuttings up here. Right, my understanding, yeah. And then, um, did they have to go through a quarantine period here in Washington State, do you know? They, well, I don't think that they went through a quarantine period. They came up certified clean and were visually inspected. Yeah, so yeah, my understanding was like, it was, um, in two places in Canada and New York where they were actually quarantined. And um, so they quarantine them because they don't want to import viruses or bugs like phylloxera. And uh, so it's very, very important uh, that we go through that process whenever uh, grape uh, cuttings are brought into the United States uh, to the, help protect our industry. Yeah, the, the fun, factor in all of this, and I'm using fun sarcastically, is that Oregon has different quarantine laws and Seven Hills Vineyard, even though we're in Walla Walla. Right. Oregon. So I don't think they went through the same quarantine as like if we 
had if they had come to Washington, they probably would have had to go through Inland Desert at the time. But uh, because they came through Oregon, I think they just needed a FIDO sanitary certificate, which is just a certificate that they were uh, looked at by somebody from the Oregon Department of Ag and determined to be clean of pests and diseases. Okay, and then Mark Colvin was very instrumental too in planting it in a few smaller vineyards around uh, Walla Walla too. Mark Colvin had Colvin Cellar. Sadly, it's no longer um, in existence, but um, he made the first known Carmenere that I know in 2001 anyway in Washington State. Uh, we've been making it since 2002. Um, but um, I'm going to just real quickly anyway go through some of um, uh, the characteristics of, of Carmen Air. And um, it's um, actually its parents is, has interesting parentage is Cabernet Franc and also an ancient grape called um, uh, Gros Cabernet and which is for the best all we know is an extinct uh, varietal now. So or variety I should say. And um, but uh, DNA is uh, born that out. So, um, but some of the characteristics of it, about it is, in, they miss in Chile. They mistook it as Merlot, and I can't quite figure that one out because at least there, the Carmenere that we grow here at Seven Hills, it's it it uh, we harvest it so much later than Merlot, and uh, and the leaves in the fall look so much different. It takes on this bright, really bright orangey, yellow, and crimson colors are just so cool. And I hope we have some pictures. Um, so Abby, I think, is going to bring some pictures up in the fall time uh, later on that uh, we can look at. Um, or she can bring them up anytime she wants, for that matter. Um, but some of the uh, characteristics of it, it is a uh, late bud break, usually. Um, and um, and it's a late ripener. So it's the last thing that we harvest out at uh, Seven Hills. I'll sometimes be harvesting it maybe even up to three weeks after uh, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon even. It drives Sadie crazy because uh, she wants to finish things up, but by golly, we're not gonna pick that fruit <laughs> till we think it's ready. Um, but you know, um, real interesting, actually, I saw a tiny bit of flowering out there today when I went out to look at it. Um, so. Well, what's what's interesting about Carmenere at Seven Hills Vineyard is for us, it's actually one of the first things to have bud burst. So we get bud break in Cab Franc and then like Petit Verdot and Carmenere in second. And so this year, I think I even saw a bud break in Carmenere first, which is, it, it just behaves a little bit different at maybe at our site. Maybe I think um, down there at the bottom, it gets really warm where it's planted. And then, uh, you know, Carmenere is kind of a test of patience because it's the first thing that have bud burst. It's one of the first things that go through bloom. It's one of the first things that turn purple and it's the last thing we pick every single year. Yeah, it, it likes a lot, lot, lot of heat to ripen. And um, one of the things about it too is um, that I've noticed over the years is um, that it ripens its sugars, it has a propensity to ripen its sugars really early. And so you go out there for, gosh, I don't know, a month or so, it almost tastes like, hey, we could actually pick this, but there's so mm -hmm. much other uh, phenolic development of flavor and color um, that needs to happen and um, that uh, it's easy to fool, fool, uh, fool somebody into picking it. So because of that early sugar development, um, but, um, but it's, we mentioned that it's um, susceptible to the Kalur and, um, and I'm gonna say that's one of the great things about growing it here in Washington State is because um, in Bordeaux, you have those wet maritime fronts that roll in during the springtime and there's nothing to protect it. Well, in Washington State, we have warm weather here almost every year, seven out of, you know, or nine out of 10 years, we'll have uh, very warm weather here. And so it's great for the Carmenere. So um, we don't have those issues that Bordeaux has as far as uh, the disease issue or disease pressure as much, the Kalur and uh, as much powdery mildew. I have seen it struggle with powdery mildew before here. Um, uh, so, uh, but it's something that we really have to look, at, look out for. It has really deep color. Um, the, um, and 
moderate tannin structure to it, moderate acid. Um, a lot of that is uh, due to, well, moderate acid because uh, we let it hang a long time it, before we harvest it. So therefore, whenever you let fruit hang longer, it's, uh, the acid is gonna become uh -huh. diminished in it. Um, but also, um, the berries themselves it has quite a high uh, juice to skin ratio. Um, and uh, which is kind of an, an anomaly when you think about it because it has such great color. And so, but uh, usually we like to see a, 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 a small juice to skin ratio and because we get uh, more extraction and more color out of the fruit. But uh, it offers up a ton of color, even though it's a little juicier, if you will, than, than, than other berries. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, the harvesting of it, though, is really su super critical on it. And um, it, uh, I'm out there all the time, you know, we sometimes, uh, well, when it's close to harvest, it's every day out there checking it and trying to figure out uh, uh, the, be the best time to harvest that fruit. And, and it's real critical. Some of the other things, uh, characteristics about it are, it's high in pyrazines. Um, pyrazines are um, compounds that give it kind of the, uh, that provide a very herbal green bell pepper uh, type uh, characteristic and that's one of the things we're trying to uh, um, avoid and so that's where Sadie comes in and uh, I saw them doing some things out there today actually that were going to affect those pyrazines. You want to talk a little bit about that Sadie? Yeah so the big thing about pyrazines is if you have on, like Cab Franc and Carmenier, even Savion Blanc, those are grapes that have a lot of pyrazines. If you have a lot of canopy, then you have more pyrazines. And so right now we're just shoot thinning, but um, what we're gonna do, and as, as soon as bloom's over in the Carmenier, we take out a lot of leaves, a lot more leaves in Carmenier than other cultivars or varietals, um, because with more sunshine on the actual grapes and less surface area, we can control those pyrazines a little bit. We, I mean, Carmenere is always gonna have pyrazines no matter what, um, but it might be the difference between the Carmenere tasting like a bell pepper and tasting like awesome cherry berry and then just a little hint of pepper um, or more black pepper. So uh, it, Carmenere is a, it, it's really interesting to grow and the, the pyrazines make it interesting because like Chuck mentioned earlier, if you're out there during harvest and you taste the berries maybe in mid-September, you think they taste right, but then you chew up the seeds and you chew up the skin and you really get that like strong sense of bell pepper and you know it just needs to hang out a little bit longer and chill out because nobody wants to drink a wine that's like pure bell pepper. And Carmenere is famous for that. And the perazines uh, mainly develop in the basil leaf. So uh, <clears throat> when Sadie was talking about canopy, we're talking about the, the shoots and the leaves. And, um, and so down at the base of those shoots anywhere are the bigger basal leaves. And that's where a lot of the perazines are, um, are developed and form. And as the growing season goes on, they work their, it, the perazines work their way from the leaves and up into the fruit. And so this is a, what they were doing out there today is a really important stage of it. They were actually uh, doing some shoot thinning, taking uh, shoots down by the base. And, and um, they were on one side, they were uh, removing, correct me if I'm wrong, one on the sunny side, you're only removing one shoot. And on mm -hmm. the shady side, you're uh, re removing two. And um, so um, it's always a real balance of uh, uh, sunshine and, and shade. We don't want to sunburn the fruit. Do you want to talk a little? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so on Carmenere, I like to say dinner plate leaves because those basal leaves are, can be the size of a dinner plate. And so you think about how big those basal leaves are and, and then the transference of pyrazines into the clusters. Um, we have to remove those basal leaves. 
the problem with if we went in and removed them right now is the clusters would be exposed during bloom time, making them more susceptible to the shatter that Chuck was talking about earlier, where when it blooms, it doesn't form a berry because it's so sensitive to wind and heat and external factors. So we're not, we're in there um, before bloom. There was a tiny bit of bloom in there today, removing the shoots we don't need so that the clusters have space, but we left those basal leaves to protect them. And then later we'll go in only on the side we call the morning side. So the, the um, canopies kind of always have two sides, but if the grapes go like this and then the sun comes over the canopy, this is the morning side. So it gets the, the nice cooler heat in the morning. And then as it comes over here, it gets a direct afternoon heat. So we are very careful not to remove leaves on this afternoon side because if you do, and it's 100 degrees, and the sun's beating down on the grapes on this side, you get really bad sunburn. But it's not 100 degrees until the afternoon, so if we remove these leaves in the morning side, and the sun's up here, and it's only 80 degrees, we don't see sunburn. And sunburn can create um, some undesirable flavors. It can make the grapes bitter. And then the biggest problem with sunburn is you get poor color. Uh, believe it or not, you would think like sunburn, more color, but what it does is it cooks those skins, and then those, that part of the skin that gets cooked or burned doesn't develop color. So um, Carmenere is probably the trickiest thing we grow for canopy management because we have to be careful right now that we get good set on the berries or no shatter. And then as soon as there's little berries out there, we wanna open that up. And so Carmenere is also one of the only blocks where we may pull leaves in those blocks two or three times. And the reason we have to do it multiple times is uh, if, so it's got those big dinner plate leaves and we pull one off, well then it immediately decides to grow back another leaf. Uh, and so as that leaf, that second leaf starts to get bigger, we have to go pull those leaves off and they come on a separate shoot called laterals. So Carmenere is really prone to different problems. Because they have those dinner plate leaves, the canopy can hold a lot of moisture and that's what causes the mildew and makes it really susceptible to mildew. So um, it's not only if we, don't take those leaves off. May the wines be very bell pepper-like. That's also what's gonna cause it to get mildew. So we need the sunshine, we need the air to get good movement around the clusters and prevent mildew as well. It, do you, can you explain to them real quickly what set is? Yeah, sorry. So oh, okay. I know, I, I forget that I'm not we're, just uh, talking to- We're so used to talking to each other, so. Yeah, exactly. So, um, Bloom, at bloom time, the grapes are self-pollinating. I'll just, I'll just start back from the beginning of bloom because people often ask if we need bees and we don't. Grapes are really cool because they're self-pollinating. Each little berry is out in the field right now, but it's still a flower. And it's a flower that hasn't bloomed yet. So um, there's a flower like this and the flower has a cap. And as this flower starts to swell, the cap pops off. And when the cap pops off and the flower opens, it opens with force and it spreads the pollen, and the pollen goes into the stamen, and then it pollinates itself and creates a little berry. So every single flower, every single berry starts out as a flower and uh, blooms and pollinates itself. So for whatever reason, Carmenere is really sensitive to disrupting that pollination. So when it flowers and it pollinates correctly, we call that set, so fruit set. Um, the berry is formed, everything's great, I'm happy. So if you, if you hear a wine grower or winemaker say it had good fruit set, that means a lot of those berries self-pollinated without any problems. Now if it's really hot, uh, sometimes the pollen doesn't go where it needs to go. And then if it's really rainy, sometimes the caps don't pop off with force. And these are things that can cause pore set. And that, uh, that's what Chuck was talking about earlier, so, or shatter. So you may go out to Carmenere at harvest time and there might only be 15 berries on the whole cluster. And you can imagine trying to go to the grocery store and buy a cluster of grapes and seeing all of the stem and only 15 berries on the stem. Uh, so we try to do everything we can do to protect the berries during that bloom time or the flowers during that bloom time to get good set. All right. so I got some photos that um, I got those photos from Chuck of Carmen Air. So I'm going to do a quick screen share. So maybe you guys can talk a little bit about what that's looking like right now. Sure. 
Yeah, so actually, actually that's one of the pictures I took today. It's, um, it's at the bottom of our block, what we call 12B out there. And actually you can look down on the ground, you can see the shoots there that uh, they've been doing some of the shoot thinning there. So um, and they just drop them right to the ground. And so this will be on the sombra or the shady side of, of the vine. And um, so uh, they just, uh, gosh, there's a crew of, uh, it was all women crew out there. They're great. They're I actually fun. have, um, I have about 20 ladies working for me and only 10 men right now. It's kind of a funny dynamic, but it works really well for us. Well, it was a lot of fun. So this is actually, this picture, like I say, was taken today. And you can see, you know, how much canopy has developed here. So this is in the fall. This was taken. Yeah, you can go ahead and uh, advance to the next picture there. The other one that just came up. Yeah, there you go. So this is our. This is uh, in the fall, right around harvest time. You see those leaves, the cool color that they get, um, and nice, wonderful cluster of uh, carmen air. I'm trying to remember what year this was, but you can go ahead and advance it. And this, looking at this picture, that's my daughter there. She's 24 right now. So <laughs> this is probably about 18 years ago or so. Uh, but, and oh yeah, there's my son. He's, my son is on the left side and he's 22. And he has hair that matches those crimson leaves out there. They both, both do. So um, this is one of our blocks. So the, First picture that I showed, yeah, there's my little daughter picking some Carmen Air. So, and Sadie, if you see anything in these pictures that you want to point out, feel free to jump in. I'm and, just amazed how good the set is that we were just discussing in these pictures where uh, the the clusters are, have lots of berries on them. It's excellent. I'm thinking the exact same thing. So this is from today. So here you are. So here's here's the flowers with the caps on too. So um, we haven't experienced bloom. However, I did see a couple of clusters out there just were starting to show a tiny bit of bloom. Um, so it's really exciting uh, for us to see that. This is one of those big changes in the vineyard that uh, it's it's a great time. So by by mid June here anyway, just about it, we'll be through. Um, bloom. So there you go. So this is what a grape looks like when it's healthy and growing. I should say a vine. You see the tendrils up top there. You can tell they're not dried out at all. And um, they grow and try to reach, find something to grab onto. And there you go. Now we're back to the fall here. And you can see the crimson color in the Carmen Air. So, like I say, how they mis yeah. mistake it for Merlot. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry, I, I sent that over. To, yeah, I sent that over to Abby today because that's like my favorite picture. Um, the red grapes are the Carmenere, the red leaves, and then behind that's Cabernet. Uh, and the Cabernet had already been picked. The Carmenere, probably not. Uh, and that's where it gets its color from, like Chuck mentioned at the beginning, is the red color. And a lot of people will ask me if those grapes have leaf roll virus. Virus is a, a problem that um, basically shuts down the grapes prematurely and turns the leaves red. And th these vines don't have a virus. That's just naturally what they do. It's really cool uh, and, and definitely my favorite thing to see in the fall. Yeah, leaf roll virus is kind of a darker brownish red. And, um... Yeah, this is, Carmenere is very, really, really vibrant. So, so I'm gonna open it up for some questions right now about the general discussion of Carmenere before we get into uh, tasting. So Abby, I'm sure you've co been collecting quite a yes. few questions perhaps, or? So um, our first question is, when growing grapes in the vineyard, do each of the winemakers have specific ways they want the grapes grown or do the vineyard managers just grow them one way? Both. Uh, so at Seven Hills Vineyard, we try to work with the winemakers really closely. 
So all of our contracts are on acres. Um, when Chuck buys grapes from me, he gets to buy full rows. I don't care if he wants a half acre or two acres or however much, but he has to buy a full row. And then we farm those rows to his uh, specifications. Working with Chuck is pretty easy. Um, actually, it's really easy and not even pretty easy. Working with Chuck's really easy because um, we have a good relationship where I think he trusts that we're doing things on time. And then he gives me, he tells me, this is how many tons I want. And then he'll come out a couple times a year. And if he doesn't like something or he does like something, he lets me know. Um, so most of our contracts, or all of our contracts are acreage. Most of my winemakers come out a few times a year. They communicate well with me. They let me know how things look. Some of my winemakers are really particular uh, and they get very involved. Um, and they like to say, hey, I want you to pull exactly four leaves on each shoot or um, we want to move the wires a specific way. The wires are what holds the shoots up tight or lets them flop. Uh, and then other winemakers I don't see at all and they live far away and they say, hey, just grow me the best grapes you can. Uh, some winemakers who buy grapes by the ton, cheaper grapes, the wine, the winery, I mean, the vineyard managers are just gonna farm those and the winemakers probably don't get as much say. Great, and then um, someone is asking where Seven Hills Vineyard is in the Walla Walla area. So I am gonna <coughs> another screen share and pull up the map so we can kind of talk about that a little bit. All right, so <clears throat> what you see there is a picture, the wall on the right, are the Blue Mountains, but uh, that's a map of the Walla Walla AVA, which stands for American Viticultural Area. And you'll see two different shades there. The northern shade there is actually the Washington portion of the Walla Walla AVA. And the lighter shade down below is the Oregon portion. So, um, uh, the vineyard is located on Horse Heaven Hills, and Horse Heaven Hills is a formation that runs from the Cascade Mountains, east and west, uh, I should say from the west, Cascade Mountains, to the east, to the Blue Mountains, and it's bisected only in one place where the Columbia River uh, cuts through the Horse Heaven Hills, and that's about, oh, 45 minutes anyway to the, to the west of Walla Walla, so, um, so keeping that all in mind, but Seven Hills, anyway, you want to go ahead and put the uh, cursor on Seven Hills there. So and there you go, there's Seven Hills Vineyard. So it's right at the base of the Four Seven Hills Formation. And uh, it's an interesting vineyard because it has a lot of different aspects in it. Uh, there's um, kind of like a bowl shape in it. And that's right where our common air block is located, is right in the center of the bowl. And uh, so um, this bowl has some north facing aspects to it, has some west facing, and uh, even eventually gets a little bit of south facing too. So um, we have one block, our 12B is right down the gut of that bowl. And then uh, the 12C is, has a little bit more north facing aspect to it. Chuck, can you elaborate on the Horse Heaven Hills and um, do they go into Oregon or where is that line? Because I know our last virtual tasting was our Finney Hill Cab over in the Horse. Yeah, the Horse Seven Hills is actually, it's um, in Washington. So it goes south of Yakima anyway, and then goes east. And by the time it gets to, oh gosh, um, well before Prosser anyway, um, it's, it goes from the Yakima Valley all the way to the Columbia Valley. So you would, um, and, but, and then keep going east. It's in Washington all the way to the Columbia River. Once you hit the Columbia River though, um, not long after that, um, it's actually uh, becoming Oregon. So just about most of the Horse Seven Hills in the Walla Walla Valley is actually um, in Oregon. So about a third of our AVA is in, is in Oregon. And I think that over on the Oregon side, they call it Vansicle Ridge. 
Does that sound right? Well, that's part of that's one of the formations there. Okay. Yeah, and they have a lot of windmills there in Van Sickle Ridge and Van Sickle Grade. There is an old railroad grade that goes mm -hmm. from uh, Helix and it goes down to the Columbia River. Uh, they pulled that out uh, probably about 20 years ago or so. But um, yeah, and, and one of the interesting things about um, the Horse Seven Hills, uh, when you come to Walla Walla, you'll see lots of windmills here. At one time, it was the largest uh, windmill uh, power generation uh, farm in the world. Um, but um, the Horse Seven Hills act like an airplane wing. So you have these fronts uh, coming through the Columbia River Gorge, and when they get to where the Columbia River makes its 180 degree bend just south of Tri-Cities and at the Oregon-Washington border. The wind keeps going straight and hits those four seven hills and comes up and over and acts like an airplane in the wing and actually speeds the wind up. And if you look at the uh, those windmills, they're actually not right on top of the ridge. They're just set a little bit below um, to take advantage of that uh, more wind there. So, um, and that creates, um, mostly good things for our viticultural area because we do have really kind of a constant wind which helps protect um, the grapes from against disease. So it provides less disease pressure, if you will. And the reason for that is if it rains, it dries out quickly here. Um, if it rain, if the vines uh, stay wet, then that just promotes, it gives opportunity for microbes, uh, spoilage microbes and other diseases to, uh, to multiply and flourish. So if the vines dry out quickly, um, hey, we're good. So that wind actually uh, helps protect uh, the vines and lowers the disease pressure. If it gets too windy, well, that can be an issue too because uh, will actually shut the vines down. When it gets really windy, um, the vines will actually start losing more and more moisture. And uh, in a, an effort to uh, preserve that moisture, the leaves in the, on the vines, the stomata, little pores on the bottom of the leaves that um, will um, uh, close anyway, and then there's no respiration and no photosynthesis occurring. So when it gets really windy, the photosynthesis stops. <laughs> so, um, but uh, is there anything else you want to say about the wind in the Horse Seven Hills? The spoils. Yeah, so the wind, the windmills closest to the vineyard are owned by Florida Electric, of all things. And uh, Norm McKibben said he talked to somebody at Florida Electric and the, wind, the windmills here on that Horse Heaven Hills, Vansicle Ridge are the most consistent, not the, not the strongest winds, but the most consistent winds they have in the country. So it's definitely, it has some challenges. We, when it's a nice day, we spray. Uh, and when it's windy, we just hope, <laughs> we hope the grapes hold on. Yeah. So in the Horse Seven Hills, um, they were formed, they're part of a group that's called the Yakima Folds and um, Manitash Ridge and all the east west running ridges in Washington are part of that Yakima Fold formation. Um, Saddle Mountains, Frenchman Hills, um, like say those ridges around Yakima, between Yakima and uh, Ellensburg. And um, whole nother geology story we could talk about later <laughs> but anyway and so in the horse seven hills you actually get um there's some fractured basalt um which is the foundation of the soils there but everything from uh, about well 1400 feet well 1200 feet down which is just about the close to the top of the vineyard there um we start getting some of the um uh what we call the um tushi beds or the ancient Missoula flood uh, formations anyway that deposited soil. So, and we get also uh, silts that have been wind deposited that we call LUS. So, uh, so at different elevations going up the Seven Hills Vineyard, we'll, we'll see a little bit different uh, soil profiles. In that. Hey Chuck, a while back, um, you were talking about Kerminer being a Bordeaux varietal. 
Um, can you um, clarify if we bottle a Bordeaux wine or if Bordeaux is more of a general category or can you just kind of, I guess, explain that? Well, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's Bordeaux style wines, if you will. But um, when we're talking about Bordeaux grapes, um, we're mostly talking about as far as red grapes, we're, the six varietals or varieties that I mentioned earlier, the Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, Malbec, and uh, Carmenere. So those are all known as Bordeaux red grapes. And so when we make wines out of those grapes, uh, we'll, we'll call them a Bordeaux style or Bordeaux uh, type wine. So I hope that clarifies it. Yeah. Um, so I was asking what people were drinking. Um, a lot of people tonight are drinking the two wines that uh, we are going to talk about, the 17 Reiniger Carmenere and the 14 CPR Carmenere. Uh, we do have a couple people drinking some library vintages. Uh, I saw as far back as the 07. Um, oh, cool. And now is a good chance to um, transition into tasting some of these wines. Fantastic. Well, the first wine uh, that we're going to taste, we're going to go with the 2017. Uh, so we bottled that last, last July. Um, and the 2017 anyway, um, you know, the berries on there, there were small to medium berries that, that particular year, and we had moderate, moderate yields out, out of it. Um, it started out um, with a fairly cooler spring anyway in a hot, hot summer, well, hot summer. And, uh, and then September, by the time the harvest time came around for, um, for the Carmen Air, um, things started uh, cooling down. In fact, we harvested this on October 20th. So it was quite, quite late in the season because things had cooled down quite a bit. And uh, so, I was just waiting for this Carmen Air just to uh, shake out those parazines, those bell green pepper flavors. And um, so when it comes to harvesting, it's so, so critical because it's like I say, it's easy to be deceived and to, to, and to pick it earlier. And once you ferment the fruit, end up with a lot of uh, green character to it. And uh, fortunately, I think we've kind of have figured it out. Um, at least it, it, it works for us. But um, again, this is, you know, really nice dark crimson color um, to it. And um, so in this one, I actually get um, some really nice dark red fruit, dark cherry going on in there. Um, and I get a lot, usually I'll get a lot of black peppercorn uh, with our Carmenere. But uh, this to me uh, has been throwing off a little bit more white uh, uh, peppercorn, so white pepper. A um, little bit of current at times tonight. I really don't get it, but at other times um, I've experienced a little hint of uh, eucalyptus type uh, notes in there, which is unusual because in this Carmenere, it's the first time in our Carmenere that I had actually experienced it, but um, I've gotten it a, a couple, couple of times. And I just get a little bit of earthiness in, in this guy too. So it's, um, hope I'm not talking into my glass too much. <laughs> so. Hey Sadie, um, since you were um, obviously at Seven Hills for both the 14 and the 17 vintage, um, before you kind of check out, do you have any um, vineyard insights onto those years that you might remember? Yeah, so one more really interesting thing about Carmenere is it uh, tends to be a biannual in the sense is it, it throws a big crop one year and a small crop the next. The other grape that does that is Nebbiolo. So as a grower, I'm always kind of keeping that in mind. So we haven't moved on to the 14, but the 14 was, uh, if I remember right, a big crop year, bigger berries. Is that correct, Chuck? And then 17 was a lighter, more moderate. So across the state, I, if I remember right, 17 was a big year in Washington. Uh, yeah. A lot of heavy, heavy crops, but the Carmenere wasn't. And we didn't have to do a lot of thinning. Thinning is where we, we go in and we take off excess clusters. So the clusters that we leave on the vine will get ripe. If you hang more than like four tons an acre on Carmenere, it, it risks not getting ripe. 
Um, so Carmenere is a lot better cropped around three tons, three and a half. Um, I think Chuck is in the two and a half to three range a lot of years. So 17, we just sort of did that naturally. We didn't have to do a lot. 14 was heavy and I feel like we had to go in and drop fruit a few times. Um, so yeah, kind of the even years in my head are heavy years in Carmenere and then the odd years are lighter years for whatever reason. Um, somebody from WSU came out and explained the biannual swings to me and I wish I could remember it all, but it was, it was very fascinating why some grapes choose to throw big crops some years and not the other years. Yeah, <clears throat> well, the, and the crop is determined is, is really, um, not the berry size, but um, how fruitful it is is, gonna, is determined the, the year before too so um but um one of the things i really really like about this wine is how lush the mouthfeel is i just think it's lush and plush um very soft fine grain tannins to it and um uh you know the tannin structure i think is very reminiscent of uh seven hills i think of seven hills being uh, more finer, sharper tannins, and when they mellow out, they get real nice, fine grain. And uh, Carmenere with a little lesser tannin structure than, say, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, even Merlot at times, um, just makes for a very wonderful, luxurious um, mouthfeel, I think. Um, but which is kind of acronistic, and not acronistic, but uh, dichotomy because. Um, it also has this rusticity to it in, the, in its flavors. So, um, and because we, I mentioned it earlier, because we do hang on or let the fruit, I mean, because we harvest it later and the fruit hangs such a long time um, that uh, it has moderate acidity. And I think that's reflected in, in this glass of wine too. I am really, really pleased with this. With this. I tell you, you know, Carmenere, when we first started working with it in 2002, it was a va 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 boom wine. It was so in your face. I mean, just exploded with fruit. It was so rich and hedonistic. It's so much so that I could only drink. It was hard for me to drink a whole glass because it was just so big and um, um, and powerful. And uh, as these vines have matured, um, the elegance has grown into it. And uh, it's, uh, I really love it. So it went from a time where I necessarily couldn't get through a glass, even though it was very uh, interesting and very compelling. Uh, it was just such a big wine, you kind of needed a knife and fork to get through it. And now with its elegance, boy, I, I, my wife and I, we have no problem enjoying an entire dinner, I mean, a bottle, you know, with dinner. Uh, with these wines now so it's really been fun and I think I, I've seen I don't think I've seen that in any other great grape to the extent that I've uh, seen it in in the Carmen Air of all the different uh, grape varieties that we work with so it's been really fun to to see it develop and in, in grow in the vineyard so um, but uh, yeah so I hope you, you enjoy that texture in that. Anyway, um, with me, I get a lot of um, dark plum, a little bit of, um, quite a bit of savory aspects going on. Herbs and, you know, a little peppery spice. Uh, again, I get some of that white pepper, but I also get a little bit of black pepper going on in there, a little uh, black peppercorn and a little bit of currant. And um, sometimes it, towards the beginning, I'll get a little bit of um, young raspberry. We have a lot of raspberries in our yard. In fact, I was just talking to my daughter, we're going to be really working hard here in the next month or so when all these uh, raspberries come ripe. But um, so I get a little hint of uh, young raspberry in there and some real, just real judicious, beautiful, um, just nicely laid, layered uh, oak spice out of that too. So does anybody have any comments, any thoughts that they want to add to it? And, 
Anybody? If I can, I think this is one of the like best balanced Carmineras I've ever had. Uh, and I get to taste, I get to taste Carmineras mostly from Seven Hills Vineyard, mostly my customers, but I love the acidity and balance and then the red fruits. Like you were saying, raspberry, there's a little plum in there, but more to me, more red fruit and just a touch of cedar. And it is so delightful and refreshing. It's really good. It makes me want to go home and cook something delicious to drink it with. All right. Well, sounds like I'm going to sign that contract again. <laughs> All right. Well, fantastic. Well, if anybody else, we don't have any more comments. Um, I think. Yeah, I, ha I have a couple questions before yeah. we move on. Um, when would be the optimal time to drink this 2017 vintage? Gosh, good question. Um, you know. Carmen Air is not going to age as long as, say, your uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, maybe even some Merlots. Um, but this guy, um, gosh, you know, if you would have asked me that question three months ago, um, I, I would have told you 10 years, it was kind of closed uh, up three months ago. Our 2017s, for some reason, um, seemed to be taking a while to open up and uh, wake themselves up after bottling, but uh, we know what was in the barrel. But this guy, I, I think, to tell you the truth, I would be drinking this just in the next four to five years. But if you wanted to go seven, eight years, I mean, you'll still have a delightful wine. But to really enjoy the, I'm really enjoying the, uh, the fruit, the dark or the red fruit going on in this. And um, uh, so I, th I think I want, for me personally, I think I would, yeah, drink this, probably most of it, I think the next three or four years to tell you the truth, but um, I wouldn't go much more than five to seven years. I, I could be wrong, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> uh, Sadie, I have a couple questions for you. Um, how big is Seven Hills? So it's about 170 acres. We're a little bit in the renovating process because most of the blocks are over 20 years old now. So we're making decisions on which blocks to pull out and which blocks to replant. So I think right now we've got about 155 acres planted. And then over the next few years, as we pull out blocks, we'll slowly start replanting them. And I sell grapes to 50 different wineries each year. So if you drink wines other than Reiniger, you're very likely to taste something that I, I grow. So when you say 150 acres, is that because you pulled some out or is that the whole, because about 175 or something like that? Yeah, and it, it gets a little muddy because the original seven hills vineyard sometimes gets included in that number so yeah, people always hill say wine. yeah people always assume the seven hills vineyard is owned by seven hills winery and they're actually not related and they haven't been related since like the 80s so at some point seven hills vineyard was expanded to like 190 acres and then the original 20 acres was sold off and so now now it's 170 acres and we've pulled out uh 15 acres or so that we're going to start replanting. So great. <clears throat> Any other questions, Abby? Yeah, Sadie, what is your, the favorite part of your job? I get to be outside. Uh, I just don't think I could do an office job or be indoors and I admire people that can and I did do a little stint in trying to make wine and I decided it was too much inside and too much uh, being wet and cold because winemakers have to clean a lot of stuff. Um, so for me, I would rather be sleep deprived up at three in the morning, um, bundled up in bad weather or sweating when it's 110 degrees outside and being outside than being inside in the day. Um. And what are your um, your favorite and then the most difficult grape varietals that you work with? So I always joke that I have a, a like a love hate relationship with Carmenere because because Carmenere requires so much canopy management. I I don't like that aspect of it, but I really do enjoy growing Carmenere because where our blocks are located at, 
uh, I can go months without watering it sometimes. And uh, it's one of those, those grapes that is very rewarding to grow. And so I know that wasn't Carmenere specific, but it's probably the most challenging thing I grow. Um, my favorite thing to grow is Cabernet and Syrah. Um, Syrah because it's really forgiving. Uh, Syrah can kind of take a little more abuse than other grapes and it bounces back and it's very consistent year after year. And then Cabernet, I really love to grow it because um, it, it's very predictable. It's predictable to irrigate. It's predictable on how it performs. And I, I've got the timing of it down well. So we know that Cabernet likes to grow really upright. We know that when we pull the leaves once, we don't have to come back because it doesn't typically grow more leaves. Um, and I just generally know how to water it so the berry size doesn't blow up and the crop doesn't blow up too much. When I say blow up, like get too big. So yeah, I really do enjoy growing Cabernet and Syrah, which is good because I grow like 100 acres of Cabernet between all the vineyards I manage. Can you tell when you're drinking a Seven Hills wine, no matter like who the winemaker was? Usually. Uh, I like to throw them in blind tastings. I, li I like to take a couple bottles and put them in a paper bag at home and try to figure it out. Um, and Chuck mentioned it earlier, Seven Hills Vineyard is a very pretty elegant site. And so it's got a unique, I'd say dusty tannins. I can pick out the, those um, unique tannins that are a little bit earthy, taste a little bit like dusty uh, and are very elegant. And sometimes Seven Hills has just a little more funk to it than other vineyards, but not as much as the rocks. And so I think I've gotten really good at picking it out. And then of course, I'm very partial to drinking it uh, because I grow it. And it's, it's one of those things for me, it's a memory in a bottle and I get to remember the vintages and the challenges of the block that year and get to taste something awesome. So I, I love drinking Seven Hills wines. Well, we love making wine from Seven Hills fruit. Yeah. <laughs> so, man, nope, Sadie and her crew, they do an excellent job there. So, and it's fun working with winemakers, or I should say vineyard managers, who really, really know their, their vineyards. Other vineyards, um, I have a lot more input in. Um, and, uh, but uh, I have a lot of faith in what she does and the operation there at Seven Hills. So it's, it's great. Thanks. Sadie, I'm not sure if you had said this, but how many wineries um, buy from Seven Hills again? About 50. And are most of them in Walla Walla? No, actually. Uh, I would say probably half are in Walla Walla, and then probably a quarter in the Willamette Valley and a quarter in Woodenville. So um, one of my biggest customers is in Woodenville. It's Patterson Cellars. Um, Chuck is one of my biggest customers. But I sell grapes to 50 different wineries because so many so many small wineries just need a ton or two tons of something. So we have a lot of small contracts and I, I would prefer to sell the small bo boutique wineries, like lots of small boutique picks than um, a couple big wineries any day. Certainly complicates things for you though. <laughs> it's interesting. We, it's like putting puzzle pieces together during harvest, but we make it work. And she does a great job with working with all different types of personalities as far as winemakers. So. Um, okay, so one more question before we switch over to the 14, and that's how long should um, we be letting the 2017 breathe? Ah, you know, I, if you have the foresight, I definitely open it up, you know, four or five hours earlier right now while um, it, at this stage in, in its life. Um, and yeah, it's going to open up. It's one of the things that um, I really enjoyed about this wine is how it evolves after it's been open for a while. Um, so yeah, just a couple hours if, if you can. And uh, yeah, just really enjoy it. And uh, you know, if you'd asked me that again, going back three months ago, gosh, I would have said close to a day, open it up <laughs> a day earlier. But um, it's really, really coming around really beautifully now. So very happy with it. 
All right. Well, good, good deal. Well, 2014 is fun. We never um, have done a, a CPR Carmen Air before, and it too is from Seven Hills Vineyard. And so we did an extended maturation on this. That just means leaving it in the barrel for a really long time. And it was in barrel for just about 64 months. And um, it's, it's a fun project. Um, I wanted to learn more about um, how, um, how Carmen Air does age in the barrel. And I think the uh, results are really, really stunning. Um, so, uh, this is um, aged in 100% uh, French oak, and uh, but we had uh, we were real judicious on it. We only used about 15% uh, or so new new oak on it. So, um, but um, this guy. Um, I get um, a little bit more earthiness out, out of this um, out of this wine, but um, and I, I, gosh, I don't know what I call feral fruits anyway. You know, I, I just think of some, um, you know, what wild uh, berry fruit going on in there. So anyway, again, it's got really nice. Uh, dark crisp crimson color to it love saying that with it and so um you know you know i grew up near seattle and i was a husky fan but my son just graduated from wazoo about two weeks ago so uh, i became a crimson and gray kind of guy so but uh anyway so i like saying crimson but uh anyway the uh uh color is really i think holding on real nicely to it and uh it's, it's just real beautiful. Ma'am, the first thing that strikes me when it hits my palate is the acidity. And the acidity on it helps focus the fruit and helps lift the fruit. And um, so this has a bit more acidity um, than than the 17 has and uh but it, it's it's uplifting with with the uh the fruit there so in the spice that i'm getting out of it um you know i get mostly like um um mellow black uh, peppercorn out of it and um i also get a little bit of fleshiness out of it when i say fleshiness um i kind of get um, a little bit of uh grilled meat and uh, for me I, I, I love it when I uh, get when that aspect when I find that as, aspect in wines uh, to me it just shows more complexity in the wine and I am I get a lot of black currant and a little bit of plum and um, a little dark cherry. And I get a little, real kind of fun little um, herb going on. In the, to me right now, it's hard for me to identify what it is, but um, um, in the past, it's been kind of um, leaning more towards rosemary on it. And um, so in the, Again, the tannins, so you can see the tannins are soft, the really fine, fine tannins on there. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's a, it's a real, real fun wine. And that acidity brings, there's a, a little bit of age to this wine, but the acidity brings a little bit of liveliness to it too. So, um, uh, yeah, I think it's a yeah, real, real gorgeous wine there, so. Gosh, so I think letting it uh, a little of that extended maturation anyway has been a very successful project. I think we'll definitely do this again. <laughs> what, do, what do you folks think about the 2014 uh, CPR Carmen Air?
Yeah, we've um, we've had a lot of comments. Um, a lot of people agree with you with that earthy blackberryness. A lot of leather and pepper. Um, just really, people are appreciating how soft it is, and just talking about just how gorgeous this wine um, expression is. Hey, you know, it, to me, it's fun. I talked about the uplifting part of the acidity, but towards the the back of my palate, though, it seems to have a real richness and density to it. Um, and uh, the finish is, man, it just goes on and on. Uh, so so um, how, how is the CPR, I guess, uh, Carmenere different uh, versus like the 2014 Reiniger Carmenere that we uh, released a few years ago? You know, that is a really, really good question. Um, it's just that, uh, um, like I said, I thought it was a special vintage. And for the CPR, what we do, those are real special lots. And um, so sometimes we'll put a little bit of uh, certain wines aside. And like I say, I wanted to learn more about this and see you know, how well it does age for extended maturation. And um, when it just turns out extremely special like this, uh, we want to uh, recognize it as such and uh, put that CPR label on it. So um, it started out as being an idea of doing, um, going with CPR, but we weren't sure, we're never quite sure until we're ready to bottle uh, whether a wine will be worthy of it. So, um, so yeah. Uh, in Seven Hills. You know, Seven Hills, I probably should have mentioned it with Sadie uh, when she was present. Uh, it's a, has received a lot of recognition. I think Wine and Spirits recognizes as one of the top 100 vineyards in the world. Uh, was it Wine and Spirits? Named it one of the top 10 vineyards in the world. Uh, so, um, you know, it's it's gotten some really wonderful recognition over the years. and. Um, and Sadie's, like I say, been there for eight years. I've worked with, well, been working with vineyard managers since 1997 with that vineyard. And uh, so she's, uh, she's done a fantastic job. Just really, really proud of her, especially seeing how she grew up in my neighborhood. <laughs> so. Chuck, can you um, kind of elaborate a little bit on the CPR? brand um, and what makes these wines different from the traditional CPR red wine? Yeah, well, the CP, C, well, first of all, CPR is really our special projects label. And also I call it um, my open, open range. It's wherever I want to go. So we don't define it by uh, AVA or um, i.e. Reininger being Walla Walla and uh, Helix being Columbia Valley. So uh, we can use, by our definition with CPR, we can use fruit from anywhere uh, we want. Uh, so uh, that's that open range concept, but just some fun creative ideas. So the CPR red wine uh, is, or what easiest way to describe it is, and that's our flagship CPR wine, uh, it's a perpetual wine. We're just about, we're going to, when we don't refer to it as vintages, we refer to it as additions. And uh, come uh, on Monday, actually, I take that back, Tuesday. Tuesday, we will be bottling the sixth edition of CPR, so red wine, which is, again, a perpetual wine. And so what we do, we took the first edition, put the blend together, but we only bottled um, that year, I think it was about 20% of it, um, somewhere in there. Um, and then to create the second edition, we took the 80% and added, replaced that 20% with another vintage and an, another uh, grape varietal. So we kept building and the first edition was five, a blend of uh, I believe five different grapes in there, but now we're up to seven different uh, grapes in it. And uh, so we, but every year we only bottle a small uh, percentage of it and then replace it with something else. So that's, 
that's the heart of CPR. But again, it's just their special projects and wherever um, our imagination, my imagination will, will take us in the world of winemaking. But we also put very uh, well-deserving um, uh, wines under that. So we've done a varietal bottling of Petit Verdot, um, we've done Merlot, um, now we've done Carmenere, we've done a, a Cabernet Franc, but uh, you know, we're not gonna do them every year. It's just when we recognize that, hey, we have an exceptional uh, block of fruit here from this vintage and uh, by golly, it deserves that CPR recognition. So that's what CPR is all about. Very special. So as I'm sure you can see here, tasting this 2014. So. How many cases a year do we roughly produce of Reiniger, Helix, and CPR wines? I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, you cut off uh, right at the start. How many cases a year do we roughly produce of uh, Reiniger wines, Helix wines, and then CPR? Oh, okay. Well, uh, CPR, um, it depends on if we do one. Generally, it's in the neighborhood of 100 cases of the red wine, CPR red wine. Uh, and anything else uh, is usually anywhere from, well, it could be as small as 25 cases, but 40, 50 cases. Uh, so this year, um, well, we're just gonna, we'll be doing about 150 cases total of uh, CPR wines this year. Um, so, and uh, the Reininger wines uh, were about, oh gosh, I don't know, 2,500 cases or so of Reininger. And um, the Helix wines uh, were about uh, in the neighborhood about 4,000 this year. 3,800, 4,000. And so, so great, great answer. Uh, are, are we uh, planning on doing another Desiderata? Always. Desiderata is always in the plans. So just question of when it's right. So. We're all, always looking every every year, I'm looking to being able to do a Desiderata. So again, that's one of our really special wines. Desiderata is um, a, an extremely special wine. Uh, as many of you know, it's named after the poem, Desiderata. Great, uh, great poem that uh, gives sage advice on navigating life from uh, cradle to grave and um, um, but it's a blend of all six noble red Bordeaux varietals and I know you all know what those are now <laughs> after we talked about them said it a couple times this uh, this evening but we've only done Desiderata twice we did it in 2003 and uh, we did it for our 20th anniversary wine that was actually a non-vintage Desiderata because we wanted to just give a make it as broad shoulders as we can showing what we've done over the years. So that was a real fun celebratory wine to make. So, but always looking for it. And Carmen Air is, is a big part of it. So Carmen Air, you know, um, when we first started making wine, we couldn't make Desiderata. I actually came up with the concept of Desiderata when I was home winemaking. But uh, there's a big problem. There wasn't any Carmen Air at that time when we first started the winery in 97. There wasn't any Carmen Air uh, grown in, uh, in our state. So uh, we had to wait till 1999 until it was planted. And uh, so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very special wine. But again, like CPR, we're only going to do it when it's... Uh, very special and appropriate. So what's really fun about it though is I'm still get emails about it, people opening it up for anniversaries, special occasions, and uh, trying it with this, I mean, incredible wines. Um, and uh, it's this, yeah, 2003 and the 2020, we called it the 2020, um, or I should say Desiderata 20 because it was our 20th anniversary. 
yeah, they're just spectacular wines and it's so much fun hearing from all of you about it. And, uh, and it's fun when you share that with us and uh, those moments uh, with us and allowing Reininger or uh, to be a part of your celebration. So it means such a, such a lot uh, to us here at the winery and makes it worthwhile because to tell you the truth, the reason why we make the wine here is because um, one, the adventure of it, but um, it's the sharing of it. The sharing of it is really what compels us uh, to make wine. And, um, and as long as you keep enjoying our wines, we'll keep making them. The moment you don't buy our wines anymore, I'll just go back to home winemaking and make wine for myself. I always say I'm selfish about making wine. I do make wine for myself, if you will, um, and uh, go where... Um, the direction where my heart and uh, soul sees where the wine, you know, a path for that wine and making it. Um, but uh, we we're really just trying to um, nurture it in um, Mother's Nature's gift, if you will. I really try not to uh, direct it too much. Um, I really try to let the fruit speak for itself, and that's why we're really judicious with the oak and um, so we just really want to chaperone and escort that process along. And uh, so the moment uh, uh, people stop buying our wine, like say, I'll go back to home winemaking, but uh, it's adventure and the sharing, which is the, really the important thing and, and drives us. And that's why we love, love it when you folks come to the winery here and uh, we get to take you back into the production area and show you what we do and really try to see hands-on what wine making is all about and um, helping people understand it and the education part of it is uh, is really really fun sharing that with people too not just the wines but the education and seeing where it comes from and getting a feel more of what wine is about and um, try to get an understanding of the types of decisions that we're making and uh, to make a wine I once Heard it said that to make a red wine, uh, there's over 10,000 deci individual decisions that go into making the wine. So, um, so yeah, so it's fun when you get when you come here and you get to see that and uh, sometimes even be a part of it. So we enjoy it when you when you come and uh, uh, take interest in what we do here. So. But we love sharing a glass of wine with you. That's that's the best thing. So this is a romantic part of uh, winemaking right here. <laughs> is is sharing and consuming a little bit of wine, toasting. So all right. Um, well, Chuck, what are um you should drink like the 2012 vintage or some of our older Carmenaires or is there a certain vintage I guess that you feel like drink now and is point I guess uh yeah gosh um yeah not not too long ago um gosh what was now I'm trying to remember recall the vintage um It was a, two, a 2004, I believe it was. Anyway, I'd, I'd say, yeah, definitely. If you, if you have some of that, I would in 2002. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely time. If you still have some of those in your cellar, um, definitely uh, go for that. Make sure that uh, you, yeah, you know, one so of the, like I think one of the biggest crimes is wine is holding it too long in your cellar. So know what, uh, how aged you like your, like your wines and how fruit forward you like your wines because it is different for everybody. And uh, uh, try to stay on top of your cellar and uh, not let those uh, wines escape you by holding them too long. So that's really important. So. Um, I know you talked about Desiderata and the CPR, but we, we've done some other um, non-vintage wines before, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, we've, um, we did a non-vintage Sangiovese, which was absolutely wonderful. I, that was one of my favorite Sangioveses. That was a Helix Sangiovese. Um, so, so yeah, you would, we'll occasion, occasionally do that. The reason why we did that, actually, um, there's a vintage, I, we weren't too happy with the vintage, um, the Sangiovese basic vintage so we decided not to even bottle that and uh but uh we we did have some uh i was holding a little bit of wine i have a really bad habit of um and actually it's for a reason but saving a couple of barrels of uh different things anyway and uh anyway so i had a couple of uh different vintages of Sangiovese still in the barrel. And uh, so, yeah, we put it together and made just a beautiful Sangiovese. I think uh, it's perhaps the best uh, Sangiovese varietal uh, Sangiovese that we've uh, produced. So it's kind of like when you're blending uh, different grapes, Cab Merlot and Cabernet, or Cabernet Franc together uh, to help fill in the blanks, if you will, or to um, create a synergy with the wines and vintages can do that too. So that's, you know, champagne. That's, uh, that's what they do with champagne all the time too, trying to fill in, fill in the gaps and uh, marry and trying to uh, uh, let uh, the different vintages shine and uh, create a synergy between them. So, so thank you so much and uh, Again, thanks for joining us here, and I'm glad you all got to meet Sadie because she's, like I say, a fantastic vineyard manager. and We really, really enjoy working with her. As you can tell, uh, she grows great, great fruit for us, so it's evidenced by our carmineers here this evening. So anyway, um, so yeah, thanks again. We'll see you here soon. Cheers, everyone.